there were two ladies, two Kenyan ladies, and these two Kenyan ladies were the best of friends. They would go to each other's neighboring village, spend time together, share their lives, share their challenges, the joys and the problems that they were having. But as time went on and they got older, they stopped going to see each other. In fact, they stopped seeing, literally, because the two of them, as they aged, had become blind. And as they became blind, they became isolated, and they lost their friendship, as well as a lot of what was valuable to them. This was the moment those two ladies were being called in one of our clinics to come onto the bus to be taken to the nearest hospital, which was around three hours away, where we would provide them with eye treatment. It was also the moment that they realized for the first time they were sat next to each other. They'd been there together for an hour, and the moment we called their names, they both had this realization they were sat next to their previous best friend. And from that point on, they grabbed hold of each other, and they stayed together all the way through to the hospital when we pretty much had to prize them apart to operate on them. These two ladies are two of 39 million people in the world who are blind. And of those in the world who are blind, the majority, four in every five, are blind from conditions that we already know how to cure or how to prevent. And it's not just the person who's blind that it affects. It's also their wider community, their family, their friends. Here in one of our midweek clinics, if you look carefully, you'll see there are two blind people with white sticks, both accompanied by young children or grandchildren, who have now lost the opportunity of an education, of a chance to raise themselves out of poverty. So we have a huge problem here, and there are many reasons it exists. One is if we look at the distribution of where blind people live. Here in this map, you see it distorted to show where most blind people are. If you look in the Americas, in Europe, it's very thin. If you look in Africa and Asia, it's, it's fatter. This is in stark contrast to where the eye doctors live. We're all here in Europe, in the Americas, and there's nowhere where the disparity between need and provision is greater than in sub-Saharan Africa. Just to give you a sense of the numbers, for every one eye doctor that is working in Kenya, there are 100 working in the UK. We're worlds apart. And being worlds apart is actually something I personally experienced growing up. I grew up with a very privileged life. I had a great childhood. My parents had moved from Egypt to the UK in the 70s to give me and my sister greater opportunities. And I grew up having a fantastic childhood. But as time went on and we would spend our summer pro summers going to Egypt, visiting family, I became more and more aware that there was a world that was different to the one I was growing up in. A world where people didn't have all the things that I had, all the things I was taking for granted. And in my early teens, we went to a place known as Zebbelin. Now, Zebbelin literally means the rubbish people. And this was a place in Cairo, on the outskirts, where the stench was so powerful it made your eyes water. And I was walking through there with my parents, and there was a boy who was probably about my age, and in fact, we looked quite similar. And I looked across at him, and I just realized that we weren't so different, but our circumstances, our opportunities, how our life was going to pan out couldn't be more different. They were worlds apart. And with that, I lived with quite a lot of guilt as a child. I felt life was not fair. Why did I have all of this when everyone else was struggling? On top of that, I was also aware that in my school, where I was privileged to be, I was the only non-Caucasian boy. So I tried very hard to blend in as much as possible. So on holidays in Egypt, I'd avoid the sun. I didn't want to be any browner than I already was. And there was another girl in the school, an Asian girl, who everyone assumed I would marry because we were both brown. So I really didn't want to be any more different than I already was. And so when my parents and my teachers were insisting that I should go and get a sight test, because I wasn't doing very well at school, and I was clearly struggling to see the board, although I knew no different, I really resisted for as long as possible. But by the age of 13, my parents finally dragged me to the optician, where they put me in my first pair of glasses. And you can see the reason why I resisted for so long. <laughs> However, when I did get those glasses, although the fashion statement they made was not as positive as it may have, could have been, what did strike me was the instant impact to my world. I went from 
seeing the world hazy to it all coming into sharp focus in an instant. And that was a, an incredible moment of realization for me that the world can change very quickly with the most basic access. Suddenly, my parents' faces were clear. I could see how messy my room really was. Lights on cars were not these big orbs, but these sharp, focused things. And I was aware that there were these, there were these two worlds, and had I been that boy that I'd seen living, sifting through waste, I would never have had this opportunity. I would have spent the rest of my life blurred. And so that was a big driver to move to Kenya, where in 2012, my wife and my young son moved out there to start a major eye project. I went from being the brown boy to the Mzungu, the white man. And there we were there to set up a major project. And the plan there was to follow up 5,000 people who'd been seen previously in 100 different locations in Kenya to try and understand some really important questions. We wanted to know why were people going blind, where were they, and what could be done. We met many challenges whilst doing this. For each of these 100 clinics, we had to identify a site, a building, get permissions from village elders. We would use primary schools, the village chief's hut, churches, whatever we could use. And when we got there, we'd set up our equipment. But often, there wasn't even roads to get to it. So here, how, you know, despite the scenery being beautiful, where this photo was taken from was where we had to stop to take our equipment. And it was an hour and a half walking, carrying 100,000 pounds worth of equipment down to this clinic to be able to run it. When there was road access, we spent a lot of time doing this. Particularly in the wet season, it was majorly challenging. And when we'd eventually get there, set up our high-tech kit so that we could do really comprehensive examinations, we rarely had a stable power supply. So in two of every three clinics, we would have to run everything from a petrol-powered generator or inverting the battery on the minibus to power our kit. One day in one of these clinics, I really needed to use the facilities. So I went out to the pit latrine. I held my breath, and I, I went to do what I needed to do. And as I approached it, somebody's phone went off. It was the classic Nokia ringtone. And the first thing that struck me was, clearly, as a doctor, I'm concerned about the hygiene of this issue. But more importantly, I'm stood somewhere where there's no road, there's no water, there's no electricity, but there is mobile phone connectivity. And again, it was in these places that were the hardest to reach where we found the most people who were blind, because no one had been there before. There were, two, there were cut off communities who really needed some kind of healthcare. And this was mirrored throughout the rest of Kenya, where 80% of people had access to a mobile device, but only 50% to clean running water or sanitation services. And so, with an amazing team, we got together and we thought, can we harness this power of connectivity and the power of smartphones to deliver eye care in a new way? And so we invented PEAK, the Portable Eye Examination Kit. We set about replacing each of the big, expensive, difficult to move around bits of kit that we had in the clinic with mobile phone apps and hardware that would make it possible. The job advert looked something like this. I need an app developer with experience in Android who understands international development, is willing to live in Kenya, and is also willing to not be paid. <laughs> Thankfully, someone answered that job description, Stuart Jordan, who has now become a great friend and co-founder of Peak. And we were set about looking at each of the tests and what we were trying to measure, and created new ways of doing those tests. It enabled us to measure vision in any language and at any age. We tapped into every element of the smartphone, so most of you on the front of your phone will have something that checks for your screen brightness. If you're outside, it will make your screen brighter. We tapped into that ambient light meter to understand how bright a room was when the vision was being tested, so we could adjust our vision test accordingly. We also tried to come up with all sorts of clever and geeky ways to maintain the right distance from the patient. We tried using echo bounce, using the front-facing camera to change, look at how the face shape was changing. And ultimately, we found the best solution wasn't technology at all, but a two-meter piece of string that was pre-cut. So technology is not always the answer. Once we'd developed this and iterated it and improved it again and again, 
we started deploying it in the field, either by eye health workers or by people who had no healthcare experience at all, comparing it to gold standard tests and finding that it worked really well. But it was key to actually build these tests on the ground with the people who were going to be using it, rather than in isolation in London saying, yeah, this is going to be great, but actually understanding and getting lessons on the ground the whole time. And here we have an example of a mother having a vision tested and her daughter behind her telling her the answers. <laughs> as much as we encourage family support, it's, under, it's important for us to explain the test, and there are some things that technology can answer. There are other things where we have to step in and ensure that it's done correctly. We also realized that giving the result in the typical medical jargon was not particularly useful. If I tell somebody their vision is 636 or 2080, unless you're in my field or you're a medic, it doesn't mean so much. We thought, well, this is visual information. Let's show it in a visual way. So we have something called SightSim. And what you can see here is it creates a live field showing the visual world based on the vision test that you've just done. And it creates a simulation so that people can understand what you have just taken on that vision test, whether it's for the carer or for the patient. Given my personal experience in schools and what I'd learned there and the lessons in terms of my own site being poor, one of the projects I was really excited to work on was one with a, an amazing eye doctor called Dr. Rono. And he looks after a population of two and a half million people where there are 400 schools. And in, that, in those schools, approximately one in every 25 children was like me. They've got poor sight and they're not able to fulfill their educational potential. In most schools, there was no opportunity to get a sight test. But in a few, a program was initiated where the eye health specialist would leave the hospital, travel to the schools, and measure the children's vision to try and find out who had a problem. The problem was, for 24 in 25 of their examinations, the children were fine. So it wasn't a great use of a medic's time. And so we thought, can we reverse this? Can we try and create a way where we keep the medics in the hospital and we, we screen the children in the schools? And so for children like this, we would have the teachers do the sight tests Close using PEEK. Right and here you can see an example of it being used. Show me the direction it's facing. So what you see here is the E changes shape and orientation, and whichever way the child points, the teacher swipes. Even if the child gives the wrong answer, the teacher doesn't need to know what's on the screen. The, the phone records whether it was an incorrect or a correct answer. If the child shakes the head so they can't say, we shake the phone and that records a not seen gesture. And that enables the test to happen really rapidly and pick up children who have a problem. It also means they can simulate that for themselves to understand what the visual world is like for that child. And then we're able to create a specific printout based on that child's vision for them to take home to their parents as a referral. The moment the vision test has been completed, the hospital is notified of those children in any particular school who are known to have a sight problem. So here we see a list of schools. Here you see Mafutu Primary School, 60 children were found with a vision problem. The moment the hospital is notified, the parents are also notified via SMS that's personalized to them. And the head teacher receives a list of pupils in their school who need to be sent for treatment. In our program, when we piloted it, 21,000 children were screened by 25 teachers. They found 900 children with visual impairment and they were able to do all of this in just two weeks. So that hopefully for children like me who weren't seeing, there's a great opportunity for them to now get their sight maximized. There we go, okay. You see this, this one child there as well who's pretending because he clearly couldn't see. We're also able to measure children who have preschool age. Uh, here, one of our co-founders, Dr. Ian Livingston, who I think did the first sight test on his child at about three hours old, which his wife was delighted about, <laughs> used novel eye tracking technology, which enabled us to monitor how the child's vision moved across the screen. And that way, they were able to pick up very quickly what a young child can see who is not able to communicate their vision. Now, it's one thing to determine that someone has poor vision, but understanding the reasons why really requires us to be able to see inside the eye. 
And typically, to see inside the eye, you either need to be a doctor or an eye specialist and carry one of those ophthalmoscopes, which usually requires you to get intimately close and share your coffee breath with the person you're examining. Or you have a big, expensive desktop retinal camera, which gives you fantastic images of the back of the eye, but they're very expensive, can cost as much as £100,000, and require a lot of infrastructure and a trained operator. So another one of our co-founders, Dr. Mario Giardini, who's a wizard in hardware and 3D printing, who actually 3D printed his own 3D printer to, to give you a sense of the kind of stuff he does, said, look, I want to help you. And so the previous designs I'd worked on, he helped by creating a new technology which could be a micro device which would clip onto the smartphone and allow us to get a view inside the eye. And here you can see my long-suffering wife getting an examination from me. Every time I had a new prototype, she'd be, uh, she'd be assessed. It also meant that non-specialists could use this. So here we have a school leaver testing a lady in a rural village in Kenya, able to acquire really high-quality images of the back of her eye, equivalent to an expensive desktop camera. And we wanted to make this technology available publicly and at low cost. So rather than taking on investment, we ran a crowdfunding campaign, which enabled us to uh, successfully meet our target, and we hope to have this available on the market by the end of the year. Initially, when the project in Kenya started, we had £100,000 worth of kit, 15 people to operate the equipment, whereas now what's needed to deliver a comprehensive eye test in difficult locations is a single healthcare worker on a bike with a smartphone. The whole thing costs less than one hundredth of the original amount. And now, the healthcare worker goes to the patient. They overcome the issue of power supply by using a solar-powered rucksack, and they see them in their own homes. And when there's connectivity, we're able to share that information through telemedicine directly to ex experts who can share that information and give us a diagnosis. Even when there's no connectivity, it's still possible to store the information and share it at a later time. Because every one of our examinations that we do is geotagged, it means that we can search by any parameter and by any disease to identify where people are and why they're losing their sight. So here we can see in Nakuru, Kenya, where I was based, people who were blind from cataract. So each of the red pins here depicts somebody who's now contactable, traceable, and treatable. In the same way in the school project we use bulk SMS services, we can do that here. So we send the patients and, importantly, a key informant, so the equivalent of the head teacher in the schools, who will collect everybody together and bring them together for treatment. So I was going to do a demo, but we'll, uh, we'll leave that and we'll come back to our two ladies. So we remember their story at the beginning, and really the reason that we do everything that we do is so that people like this are found and treated. <laughs> it's only in statistics that people are going blind in their millions. The reality is people go blind alone, but together we can do something about it. Thank you. Good luck.